hormones when children reach puberty spirituality pushes up it rises and in most cases what will happen the kids that are already anxious will begin to have panic attacks uh, kids that don't, oh, they'll become wallflowers. They want to be in everybody's periphery. They don't want to be the center of attention. Then you have the child who becomes the class clown. And the class clown insulates themselves in kind of a bubble where people laugh at them or with them, but they feel more accepted, but they're still not comfortable in their own skin. Also during this time frame, and now it's really a lot of uh, upper elementary school, because puberty has changed from all the fast foods that we eat. So these kids, they just don't know what's wrong with them. They don't know what they're feeling as empaths, that they're feeling everybody's energy all over the place. Uh, they, um, they will start to cut themselves. They will begin alcohol, they will begin drugs, which of course are much more prevalent today. They were around back then, but not the way they are today. And suicide attempts and suicide completions. I still get all this. Okay, I get it all the time. And it's all about that push. Welcome in. I'm so excited. I have the most interesting guest today and someone that's just been on my big wish list for a long time. And I'm really excited for you guys to meet her. But before we get started, if you're enjoying this content, make sure you click that subscribe button and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of our upcoming videos. And if you're interested in what's going on on the planet, but you feel a little overwhelmed, you might want to sign up for our Friday morning email newsletter. The link is in the description box down below. We put together an email newsletter every week, kind of highlighting the things that we think are important going on in the planet. It's super free, super informative. I think you're going to love it. And with that, I am so excited to welcome in the legendary Pat Longo. Pat, how are you today? Oh, thank you so much for that intro. Legendary, I'm not sure, but... I oh, I'm sure. <laughs> very happy to be here. Yeah. Um, people try to tell me that all the time. And I'm like, but I'm just this little person that sits here day after day after day. I don't think about outside the box. Mm -hmm. But yet, obviously, I'm outside the box. So yeah, obviously, you're outside the box. But I feel like that's one of the interesting points. And you've already made it is that so many of the really incredible healers are so busy doing what they're doing that they're not even noticing the noticing of them, yes. which is definitely your story. So why don't you kind of start from the beginning and share your journey and I'll kind of pop in with questions from time to time. It is so fascinating. The viewers are going to love it. Well, let's see the beginning of my journey. I always knew there was more. I didn't know what as a child, I was always a little bit different than the rest of my family. Uh, I was always thinking, I feel like I'm an, I'm an, I'm an observer. I've become an observer and I stand back and even large crowds, I'm always watching, I'm always looking. And I guess that was a little bit of something that was going on with me that set me aside. Now, when the journey started, I had started a class with a spiritual healer. Well, no, she, I'm sorry. She wasn't a spiritual healer. She was a psychic uh, and she was teaching a metaphysical class. And again, I fell into it. And we all know there are no such thing as coincidence. And one thing led to another. I, I met somebody in a little circle and that person looked at me and he said, when the student is ready, the teacher shall come. He said, but I'm not your, your teacher. And he, he, I picked a card out of a deck and it was the crone of Capricorns. That's what it said. And it had a tall Indian woman and a teepee ushering a younger woman in. And right after that, I met that teacher who happened to be a Capricorn. She was a very tall, dark haired woman. And of course, I'm four foot 10 uh, at this point. I was four foot 11 on my license. I've kind of shrunk a little bit. 74, you kind of, your vertebrae goes <laughs> like this. So I, um, I was that student being ushered in and everything opened for me 
And it was like three weeks into the class. It was about everything. It was metaphysical. It was about angels. It could be about dousing rods, uh, tarot cards, even UFOs. Whatever you didn't understand, we talked about. But there was no, the consistency was smudging ourselves when we came in, picking an angel card from the deck, and meditation. Those were the three solid things. Everything else was in different directions. Now, three weeks in, my hands started to burn. I had no idea it was from the class. It didn't actually happen in the class. And I just couldn't get my hands to cool down. And I said to my husband, my hands feel like hot pokers. I don't know what's wrong with me. <laughs> I actually blamed it on menopause, but I wasn't that old yet. And I said, I thought it was supposed to be hot flashes, not hot hands, but they were just so hot. And I put them on cold water. I was it just, it was so uncomfortable. And uh, when I went back to class the following week, it was a rainy Monday morning. And I sat, I always sat on the couch. Everybody kind of sat where they usually came in. And there were, I think there were 10 women. And there was a woman in my periphery and she was twisting and turning. She was on a folding chair. And every time I turned around and, and here it was, and it was distracting. And I guess the teacher noticed it as well. Her name was Holly. And um, <clears throat> Holly said, Pat, could you move over on the couch, please? And let so-and-so sit next to you. And I don't, even know the person's name, I don't remember. So I moved over and she sat next to me and we're kind of like cheek to cheek. And Holly then looks at me and said, Pat, put your hand on her leg. And I just kind of looked at her and my eyes rolled like really. And, uh, you know, she said, no, no, just put your hands on her leg. <laughs> okay. So I put my hand down on her thigh. I did nothing. I didn't know I was supposed to do anything or what to do. Healing was not a word that I was familiar with at that point. So my hand goes on her leg and two minutes later, her pain is gone. And she had been in a car accident a few years before and she had a lot of soft tissue damage and rainy Monday mornings will do that to you. So it went away and everything kind of spun out of control for me because I was like, what just happened? You know, I, I got in my car to go home and I don't know how I got home. And I just kept thinking, why me? what is this? You know, where do, how, where, do, where do we go from here? And uh, there were no other healers in the class. So I started to practice and I practiced unknowingly on my siblings, on two of them. And uh, what, what would happen in the beginning is I would put my hands on their shoulder. Like one of them, we, we were at a little gathering and they were in a hot tub, both my sis, two of my four sisters. I put my hands on one of their necks and I was just kind of giving them a little massage from outside and their pain went away and I got it. And then the other one had a migraine or the start of one and she'd always had them. So I'm just kind of rubbing in her head <laughs> and I'm thinking, I don't know what I'm thinking, but I'm thinking to take this pain away and her headache went away and I got it. So I said, oh no, 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 something's wrong here. <laughs> I need to have a talk with God. And when I went home, I kind of did just that. And I said, look, I surrender. Whatever this is, I'm all in. But I cannot walk around with people's pain. It's just not going to happen. And unbeknownst to me, I didn't know the word empath. I didn't realize what an empath I was. I didn't realize that throughout my childhood, I was always sick. I was picking up I had five siblings. I was picking up everything. And my father would take me to the doctor and, and nothing would be wrong. And I'd say, but daddy, my throat hurts. And he's, you know, I got labeled the hypochondriac, you know, but it was everything they had. I had double, you know, it was always something constant. Uh, so I started very young with autoimmune diseases, uh, psoriasis. Well, psoriasis came later. It was eczema first. There were hives. There was allergies of all kinds. Then asthma came around eight. I, I started getting migraines, sinus infections, um, irritable bowel syndrome, which didn't even have a name, I don't think, back then. But my stomach was always up and down, up and down. And uh, then the psoriasis came. I know I'm leaving some out, but uh, I got the psoriasis. And the psoriasis actually became psoriatic arthritis. So in my 30s, and it started in my 20s, but I didn't know what it was. So I, it jumps from joint to joint. So the right side of my body was the side it picked. And I don't remember where it started. I think knees, but I know elbow. Um, I was doing a fundraiser for my children and we were raking leaves for the elderly so they could make money to go to Europe to play soccer. And uh, 
my, and the, of course, the parents did all the raking and the kids did all the jumping in the leaves. So my elbow started to throb and it was so painful that I'd have to put my arm out straight underneath my husband's pillow at night to keep my arm straight because I tended to sleep like this and I couldn't open my arm in the morning. So I went to uh, a doctor, you know, an orthopedist, got a shot, cortisone in my elbow, it worked the first time, second time, not so well. Uh, and I ended up in a sling for a few weeks. So that was the end of that. But again, I didn't know what it was yet. So elbow works itself out. Next thing, I think it was the ankle. From the ankle, it went to the shoulder. From the shoulder, it went to the hip. And each one were months in the making and throb, throb, throb. So it was, I think my twins were 12 uh, at the time. So that would, have, they, you know, they were 12 and it was... Um, at that point in time, they were well into their teens when I finally figured out what it was. And I did that only because I saw a pamphlet in the chiropractor's office and uh, it said the spine and psoriatic arthritis. I couldn't find anything else to read. I read it and I ended up at a rheumatologist and I had the psoriasis patch in the back of my, it was called a herald patch. It was right at the nape of my neck. And it used to drive me crazy, itching. And the, when you'd sweat or, oh, would be so, or get upset, irritated, it would, it would itch. So this was all tied in. Everything was tied in. So I have to lead all this up to where I'm going. So just so you know. Uh, so he wanted me to take a very powerful drug, which I, I now to the, in this day and age, it's, it's really poison. But um, that's what they wanted me to take. But I had to watch a video for the other medicine that they wanted me to take because this medicine was going to eat a hole in my stomach lining. So really? No, I don't think so. I, I did the first month. That was the end of it. Once I realized what was going on, I said, I'll lose weight. I'll do whatever I have to, but I'm not doing this. And shortly thereafter, the class came about and I found myself a healer. Now, I did not know where it came from, but I certainly knew it didn't come from me. I knew that it was coming through me right from the first day because I was just a mom, a wife, a daughter, a sister. You know, I was all these things. I was not this other person overnight, but that's how it happened. It happened so fast. Now, what you may have read was about my mom. So I want to talk just a little bit about my mom. And my mom had been diagnosed with inoperable breast and bone cancer. She had a lump and it was at least at the very least five years before anybody found out. She told me later on, she thought it was more like 10, could have been that long, but she would wash it with holy water and her breast was inside out and bleeding. And by the time we got her to a doctor, it was already in the ribs, the skull, and the pelvis. So it was a metastasized breast cancer. And there was no operation coming her way. They started her on a little bit of, of chemo. It was not good for her. Her blood counts kept dropping, her white counts. And uh, they gave her tamoxifen. And I'll, I'll definitely give a thumbs up to that for her. She always felt comfortable with that. But I took her to a healer before she even got that far. And um, I heard about this woman from a psychic. And every now, from the time I was 25, I liked to visit psychics. I would go to fairs here and there. Little did I know that I'd be running them myself for years and years and years. But I did. I would go in. Again, remember that observer person I was? I would go in and I would pick two people from their flyers. And I would go in. And then when my daughter was 18, I'd take her in and she'd pick two. And we would compare notes. And I never really found anybody but one person that was actually really good. So... Again, the observing I did back then helped me years later because I am very, 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 very specific about who goes in my fairs and they have to be, they, they speak for me, they're, they're speaking in my name. So therefore they're representing me. I have to make sure that they do the right job. So again, that's just a little side note of my crazies. So my mom, I take her, I call her up, I call this woman up. And um, I wanted to make sure she wasn't crazy. And people do that to me now. You know, they, they expect you to have horns and a tail and waving dead chickens all the time. But um, she sounded 
lovely on the phone, just lovely. And so I, I made an appointment. I called my mom and I said, do you trust me? And she said, yes. I said, we're going to go for a ride. It was like a two hour ride. And uh, the woman was, um, she reminded me of a flower child. You know, she had long, flowy, wavy hair and she was in a big flowing skirt and bare feet. And uh, she put me in front of Oprah and I watched television while my mother went upstairs to get a healing. And uh, the psychic had said to me, when I walked in, he told me, you're worried about a woman above you and a male below you. He looked at her picture. He told me all the places that she had the cancer. And he said, and I think they missed the liver because I see some pinpricks in the liver. And he handed me the card of this healer. He said, she's had some success with cancer. I said, what does she have to lose? So that's where this journey began. When When my mother came out, we got in the car. I wasn't present during the healing. And we got in the car and the woman came running out. It was cobblestone. So she's running in her bare feet. And I opened the window. I'd already started to back out. And she said to my mother, uh, do you pray to the Blessed Mother? And my mother said, every day, because my mother did novenas for years, every day. She did the rosary several times a day. And she said, well, she was there in the room with us. And she said, I was just so overwhelmed that I didn't say anything. So on our way home, my mom looked at me and she said, why not me? And meaning the cancer, why not me? And that I had never expected to hear. But this woman had explained to her, what's eating you up inside, she had said. And there was something that was for 20 years bothering my mother, and she kept it quiet and to herself. And uh, that very day, she opened up about it. And she went into remission. So I put the two together. My mother lived for 15 years. All right. She didn't pass until she was 84 and she didn't pass of cancer. When she passed, my, my dad passed a year, uh, about 16 months before her. And they were married for over 60 years and she was devastated. And I watched her go down hill from there. It was one thing after the next, after the next. But for those 15 years, she took care of my dad. Her oncologist loved to see her. She would always go on her regular visits and help the people out in the, in the waiting room because she'd always have an angel book. I had given her some of my angel books and she'd be reading about angels and she just became such a light. And the doctor loved to see her because she never had a problem. <laughs> so that is, I guess that really pushed me to get into this class and understand what does that mean? What is this? What is all of this? Okay. And my journey began. Oh boy, did it begin. So once I began that touching and I surrendered uh, to God, I built a protection and that protection you'll hear all over the place because it's on every video, every podcast. and It is. And I know so many healers that use your protection. Well, amen to that because I wrote that book because I felt I needed a bigger megaphone and it still isn't big enough. It's not a big enough megaphone. So I do accept every podcast, every interview that comes my way. Every time somebody asks me, I'm more than happy to do it and explain it and push it out because I now work in 45 countries. So it, it's not that the book went there. Um, it is going there now because every client that I have, I actually, they get homework. And on the homework, there are 11 books. Mine, of course, starts at the top. And I teach them that there's 13 hours of information in that book that can help anybody that's an empath or has extreme anxiety, all right? The book itself, The Gifts Beneath Your Anxiety, it's really, I I wasn't going to name it that. I was going to call it, you're not sick, you're psychic. Because people kept coming in and saying, am I crazy? Is there something wrong with me? I have all these thoughts and and I feel this and I see this and I hear this and I've got such terrible anxiety. And I would say to them, you're not sick, you're psychic. But The publishing company said, you know, if you put psychic on there, less people are going to pick it up. So I said, well, from a marketing standpoint, that makes sense. I'll figure out another title. I really wanted it to reach the people with anxiety to understand how their spiritual gifts are connected. Yeah. Can you drill down a little bit into why or how you identified that those with anxiety are really just pushing away information that maybe the rest of us are not picking up on. Okay. Well, I will tell you this. What I've discovered is that it is connected to hormones. Okay. So 
hormones when children reach puberty spirituality pushes up it rises and in most cases what will happen the kids that are already anxious will begin to have panic attacks uh, kids that don't, oh, they'll become wallflowers. They want to be in everybody's periphery. They don't want to be the center of attention. Then you have the child who becomes the class clown. And the class clown insulates themselves in kind of a bubble where people laugh at them or with them, but they feel more accepted, but they're still not comfortable in their own skin. Also during this time frame, and now it's really a lot of uh, upper elementary school because puberty has changed from all the fast foods that we eat. So it's eight, nine, and 10 now. It was 11, 12, and 13 when I started. So it's just a little bit different. So these kids, they just don't know what's wrong with them. They don't know what they're feeling as empaths, that they're feeling everybody's energy all over the place. Uh, they, um, they will start to cut themselves they will begin alcohol, they will begin drugs, which of course are much more prevalent today. They were around back then, but not the way they are today. And suicide attempts and suicide completions. I still get all this, okay? I get it all the time. And it's all about that push. Some kids see it all early, you know, they see it when they're younger. I get that uh, almost every day too. You know, I saw this, I felt this, I heard this, I shut it down. I was afraid. My parents told me, you know, that's nonsense. You know, all these, um, what do you call it? Uh, friends that you, imaginary friends that kids get and stuff yeah. like that. They're not imaginary. And if people would learn about this stuff and learn to listen, they would understand that these kids are just very spiritually open. All right. Everyone has intuition. Everyone on this planet has it good, bad, or indifferent. We've got it. It's learning whether or not you're going to open up that gift and how to use it. So getting back to your actual question, <laughs> uh, I will do that. You'll see, I'll go off here and I'll go off there, but I always come back to where I started. Now, the anxiety, when I, I probably was working with it all the years that I was working, whatever anybody came in with, whatever problem they had, because uh, remember, I was a healer first and foremost before I started teaching any of this. So if they came in with a cancer or a diabetes, an MS or anything, anything at all uh, that they would come to me with, anxiety was one of those things. So I would do my, do my talking with them. I would do my healing and they would get better and it was all fine. But I have to honestly say, I'm going to pull Teresa Caputo in here. Because it was, um, I started training her in 2001 and it wasn't long after she, she very quickly within two weeks, she was, and she had no idea. Trust me when I tell you, she did not have a clue. She argued with me at my front door uh, and said, I, that wasn't me. That wasn't me. It was because I was sitting in that medium's chair <laughs> who was there last week. I said, no, 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 no. That's not how it works. But she really had a lot of fear and I had to work with the fear and I had to work with the anxiety because this stuff came at her really quickly. Now you could love her or hate her. It doesn't really matter. I know what I know from when we began. Now I was taking her, uh, another medium uh, out there, uh, which everyone should know, Kim Russo. Uh, Kim and I went to the same teacher and we didn't, we weren't in the same class, but we melt, melt. <laughs> We immediately merged when we met in a, in a driveway uh, of the teacher. And it was like we were friends and knew each other forever. We didn't stop talking after that. So Kim, I lost my train of thought, you know, when I said melt. And I'm trying to come back to where I was. I have a lot of stories actually to tell you about that. But anyway, Kim called me up and she said, Pat, I have this group I can't do. Do you have anybody that could do it? It's at a beauty parlor. And um, it was several towns away. And I said, yeah, sure. I have a couple of people. And I was going to have Teresa be one of them and another girl, Bobby, that was in my class. The medium actually who told Teresa this was going to happen really fast for her uh, and whose chair she was sitting in. And um, so we went and Teresa was a total basket case. She actually dug her claws into my arm while I was driving on the highway. 
And I was trying to calm her down and I had to pull over. I said, all right, it's going to be fine. She goes, well, promise me you won't give me any men. I said, don't worry about it. We're going to a beauty parlor. How many men are going to be in the beauty parlor? Relax. So we get there and Bobby goes here and Teresa goes there. And of course, you know, there were two men. And each time the man came in, Bobby already had somebody in her chair. So Teresa ended up with both men. So out the door we go at the end. And this time, she put her hand on my arm very gently. And she said, I feel whole for the first time in my life. Oh, wow. You see, and it was everything. It was all the mediumship coming out and the anxiety just went like this. And that honestly is when I put two and two together. And that was a long time ago. I didn't, it, it, it's when I recognized the correlation between the two and from that point forward, I began teaching very differently and come to, it was 2012 though, before I actually made a program, an actual program for my students. So it was after Teresa was on the air. And I, again, I teach very differently now. I have, I have so many more tools in my tool shed to give to people, to help them open up quickly, to understand it, to get rid of the anxiety. All right, I'm, I'm going to take you to another story. I'm going to go into my granddaughter, who is very, very gifted. And I have 17 grandchildren. I have a lot of them that are gifted. But this one in particular, and I, I'm not going to mention her name, but uh, when she was eight and a half, I knew she had anxiety. And I, I hadn't up until that point. We were at a bridal shower. And she walked in with her mom and her four-year-old sister. And I could see fear all over her face. And I, I walked up to her. I pried her off her mother's thigh. I was very upset with myself. I said, I am her grandmother. I do this for a living. And I did not know that this child had anxiety. But I, I realized that she only saw me in a comfortable setting at her home, my home, her calls. And so walking into a bridal shower where she knew nobody, that was another story. So I walked up to her and I said, do you, do you get uncomfortable when you're around people that you don't know? Her eyes got big and she nodded her head. And I took my two fingers and I poked her right in the solar plexus. And I said, do you know the wrestlers that your brothers watch on television? And she said, she nodded her head. She had her eyes closed. I told her to close her eyes. And I said, you know, when they win, they raise this you know, belt up in the air with a big gold buckle, you know, like macho, whatever. And she nodded her head. And I said, okay, I want you to imagine that belt right now where my fingers are right there in that spot. And I want you to put that belt on. And that was the end of her anxiety. Okay. Now that day she ran around, she had a blast. She had a wonderful time. I actually grabbed her when she was running by me and asked her how she was doing. She said, oh, I'm having so much fun, grandma. And off she went, but I knew what was coming now. Because I know where anxiety goes, extreme anxiety. So at 10, well, nine and a half, I guess she started to really feel spirit, really feel spirit, but she didn't still understand it. So I had to give her a little bit more protection. And I gave, she didn't want to go to a sleepover. And I said, well, why don't you want to go to a sleepover? And she said, well, every time I'm walking to my friend's house, I start to feel this weird feeling in my stomach. My stomach starts to bother me. So I talked her into going to the surprise party at her friend's, the sleepover at a friend's house. And uh, she didn't last more than three hours and she was home. So I checked in with my daughter-in-law. She, I said, she told me what happened. I said, something's not right. Tell me more about the family. And she told me that the father had passed away. So now I knew what she was feeling every time she was heading towards that house. So by 10, she was seeing spirit in three dimensions. Just like you and me, she could see she's seen my husband, her other grandmother, her dog. Uh, she's picked up a couple of hitchhikers in a room. And I'm always telling her, if you just tell them to leave, <laughs> they will go. She goes, ah, they don't bother me, Grandma. They just block my bathroom. I said, no, 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 no. If you're not going to talk to them, you picked them up from somewhere and you need to tell them to go. And that's kind of the way it went until one day I came in and I gave her an eyeball and I looked at her and she goes, he's gone, Grandma. <laughs> And I said, and how did that happen? She said, I told him to leave. I said, I rest my case. So again, these are things that I teach people that have anxiety, that they're feeling spirit. All right, let's just say this. Each of us, you and I right now are having a conversation. So there's two of us in the room. Now add to that at least one master guide. Okay, we get a guide 
the moment we're conceived. So here we are, we've got four, you and I now. Now we add two angels because everybody has angels in their universal team, but the angels cannot step into your energy field unless invited. It doesn't matter how you suffer. If you do not call them in, they do not come. They cannot come. All right. But now you have two more. I have two. That makes us eight. All right. So let's add loved ones to that. Loved ones that have passed before you were born that are connected to you by a bond of love. So let's say they know what's going on. They know you're gifted. They know you're intuitive. They want to help. All right, so two for you, two for me, and now we're 12, okay? There's 10 energies, but we're 12. So walk into a movie theater. Everybody starts with five. Times that, and you will know how much spirit energy is in that movie theater. So here you are, you come in, and you're openly gifted without protection, and you have a light that comes out of the top of your head. And all spirit can see that light, so they come in like moths to a flame, all right? And this is what happens when anxiety comes out because you're being closed in by energy, spirit energy. It's not the people. That's the empathic part. You can feel other people's uh, sorrow, pain, laughter, joy, uh, illness. That's, that's this piece. But the other piece is spirit. And if you think about trying to keep the moths out at your front door in the summer, trying to keep them out of the house, that's kind of what it's like. So they don't want to hurt. Nobody wants to hurt anybody. They just want to talk. They see your light. You're, you're a voice for them. And they just need a voice. I'll tell you one more story about Tree. I could tell you a million stories, but I just, this popped into my head. And I always say what pops into my head as it comes. So Teresa was on her way to do a group. And there was probably 54 people in this restaurant. I had set it up for her. And she went every other week. And it was always, always sold out. So um, she called me up and she she's on her way and her husband was driving and she said, Pat, are you sure I'm a medium? And of course, my eyes rolled in the back of my head, you know, oh, but I'm going to throw up. I said, Teresa, spirit is just as excited to meet their relatives as the people waiting in that restaurant for you. And somebody's here ahead of schedule. So all you have to do is tell him to back up, present himself when you get in front of his loved one. Okay, that's all you have to do. I mean, I laugh at all of them because I, I get this all the time with every new medium that I teach uh, and no one can accept because it's so subtle. It's so subtle. You don't even realize that you're being talked to. You don't because it comes in your voice. And so once I explain it, I mean, she went to the restaurant. I said, look in the curtain, you'll see who it belongs to, and then call me. So again, you were right. You were right. You were, I said, why don't you just listen to me the first time? I'm always right. Oh, Pat, it sounds like crowd control. <laughs> it really is, honestly. <laughs> and with my granddaughter, she's she's 18 now. And, um, you know, she has tremendous boundaries and she has absolutely no fear. And that's a big thing that I teach is no fear. This is nothing to be afraid of. And the protection is not to protect someone from fear. It's preparation. It's like being a good Girl Scout. It's, it's just making sure that your energy is clear from energies that you don't want. Because listen, there's good people in the world. There's bad people in the world. The same thing applies to spirit. There's negative and positive. So when you're, let's just say we're, we're all a frequency, we're all a vibration. And if your vibration, if you come across somebody whose vibration is very low, you could pick up company, a hitchhiker that you don't expect to have. And uh, uh, my granddaughters, are her, hers have always been pretty good. Um, once she picked up a little boy in the back seat of the car and she's teenage, she wasn't driving or anything. And she said, grandma, there's this little boy in the back seat of the car. I said, whose car? She said, doesn't matter. Who's <laughs> have a car I'm in. He's in the back seat. And I said, well, I don't recognize him. So we talk about it. And I said, all right, this is what you have to do to send him into the light. He's lost. And I just give her instruction and she does it. She's like this A student. She's really amazing. But she listened to everything I told her to do. Now, if everybody would do that. <laughs> If everybody would just do that the first time I tell them, it would be so much easier. Uh, go ahead. I know you got And something. maybe we have, should have this curriculum in first grade at school. Oh, you I think that's, that's what is so crazy making, particularly about our culture here in the U.S., which where we're talking in the U.S., 
Other cultures, I think, are a little bit more accepting or can be a little bit more accepting of spirit and the afterlife and that sort of thing. But we deny children their reality. Then they have to stuff it all the way down. And if they don't come across someone like you, they're going through life not really realizing that what they're doing is sensing other energies around them, which is perfectly normal and healthy. Well, you know, they, I have, I believe it's my thought process that since 2012, every child that was born came in wide open, wide open. Okay. Prior to that, not, not as wide. And, but these kids are all getting labeled ADD, ADHD, OCD, ODD. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. Some I don't even know, but this is what's happening. Everyone's getting labeled. Everybody's being medicated. And this is the worst thing that you can yeah. do. But yeah. it's not taught in the schools. They are, listen, there are some things, a uh, few wellness things that are happening, I believe. And I have come across a few women that have come to me and they're pushing things out into schools. They're doing programs. But I train a lot of teachers come to me because they're nurturers and they, you know, they're with the kids, you know, 24 seven with all these kids more, even more so than the parents. And I teach them how to do it in different ways, how to protect the children, because technically you can't bring God into the schools, unfortunately. So everything has to be said a certain way. And so I managed to teach them how to play games with these kids and teach them using superhero belts. Well, what uh, oh, bubble guppies? That's because the bubble that I like to surround everybody in is a cartoon that's called Bubble Guppies that my grandchildren have watched. And so I'll say, depending upon the age of the child, have you ever seen Bubble Guppies? Because the moms now, I want them to protect their children. Because every mom I talk to, I said, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. How many children do you have? And how many of them are showing signs of anxiety or too sensitive and things like that? And of course, I hear it every day. So I go to the bubble guppies and I said, you could. And then, of course, the tree, that's the second one, grounding yourself into the earth. Very easy to get a kid to pretend they're a tree. You know, so I said, you, you have a job to do and you can do it. But start with the belt. The belt stops the anxiety. That's the first thing. Now, you know, I do it a little differently. It's bigger than that. It's, it's, it's a, a magnificent bubble of God's light. And then we ground into the earth like the roots of a tree. And then the shiny metal vest of armor comes on. Now, the shiny metal vest of armor, it covers your heart, your lungs, your solar plexus, which is the big troublemaker, and the digestive, well, the, the, the abdomen. So people that are super empathic get digestive issues, autoimmune diseases, high sensitivities, allergens, all these things can dissipate. They can all go away. I am the perfect example. And I, I didn't even say that before when I was telling you the healing story. But when I started healing, everything I had went away. Wow. Everything That's I had went away to this That's day. Stunning to me. It is just stunning, but such a, a testimony it to was, energy. I was the guinea pig and I was 35. I didn't start Holly's class. I was approaching 40. Maybe I started getting interested uh, somewhere around there. It was in the mid nineties. And um, I, listen, I was bone against bone on my x-rays. Uh, everything was there. And I started healing and I knew it wasn't me, as I said, but what I have found out since is that I have these huge archangels that work with me. And I'll tell you in a minute, but there, the energy comes in through my head and out my hands and it goes into the head of the person in front of me. But as it's coming through my body first, that's the only thing I can assume because oh, everything right. disappeared overnight. I mean, I, I was 35. I'm 74. I can roll on the floor with my grandchildren. I can run down a hill. I couldn't do any of that. I couldn't even drive in a car with my husband without being in excruciating pain or sleep at night. So everything changed. I forgot all the pneumonias I had and the bronch. I haven't, I had pneumonia six times. I had bronchitis whenever I didn't. None, I haven't had any of it since. In all these years, my sinusitis went away, my asthma went away, my migraines went away, my irritable bowel, everything you could imagine disappeared. All right. Now, go ahead. I, when I visualize body aches or pains like you're discussing, 
what I see in my mind's eye is like a little dust bunny, a little dust bunny of energy that's all tangled up. And it sounds like the energy that's coming through your head kind of dissipates that dust bunny. What I'm wondering is, do you feel that energy and do you feel that dissipation? And I know when you first started, the migraine would come to you, the neck ache would come to you. What is it about that little dust bunny of energy that transferred that no longer does? Hmm. Well, I see it with my clients every day. All right. Um, I get, and I get constant emails. Amen. I get beautiful emails after people leave me. Like, I can't believe it. I can walk. I can do this. I could climb a mountain. And then somebody has actually done that. And um, I, I can do so many things that I couldn't do before. This went away. That went away. You know, I can't guarantee anything, as you know. How does the dust bunnies? Well, uh, when I set up when I set up the protection right after I started taking on people's things, that protection stopped me from taking it on from anybody else. Once I did that, I wasn't taking anybody's pain on anymore. Only when I needed to. Okay, let me be clear about that. If I'm in a healing and, and I always ask people what's wrong with you before I start, I said, even if it's an ingrown toenail, I want to know about it because I'm going to power wash your body from the roots of your hair to the soles of your feet. And so I want to know everything and I'm going to stop in all those places and I'm going to do a little extra work. So for me, once I put on that protection, everything, as I said, completely disappeared. And if I need to feel it because they forgot to tell me something, I'll feel it. I might feel a pain, a throbbing pain in my pinky. So I'll say to them, did you, did you ever hurt your pinky? Oh yeah, I broke it when I was five years old. Now maybe it didn't heal right. I don't know why I have to feel it, but every now and then when somebody forgets to tell me something, I'll, maybe I'll get a pain in the side of my breast or all of a sudden my hip will hurt or knee. And I, as soon as I say it to them and they acknowledge it, it's gone. So I don't have to sit with it, but it's used kind of to fill me in. I still moved away from your, from your question because other things keep running through my head. <laughs> Go with the things. <laughs> It's other people. <laughs> well, you know, there's always, always stories. And um, I haven't actually told one in a while of, of some amazing things that have happened and things that humble me beyond, beyond, beyond. But some of them started early on. And I'm thinking of this beautiful little girl, Angelina, who was just a hair over a year old when she came to me and um, her mom, her dad had to take off from work because the mom had to sit in the back and hold her. Uh, she cried all the time. She had something called ringed 22nd chromosome disease or disorder. Now the internet had just come out. So I tried to look it up before they got there, but forget about it because it's a chromosome that, that ended up this way and it's supposed to be, oh no, it had supposed to be this way, but it ended up in a ring. Uh, I have no clue. And um, it, creates everything in your body to go help the skelter. So, but every case is different. So this little girl comes in, she already has one kidney removed and she's just a, barely over a year. And um, she presented as if she had cerebral palsy to me. When the dad walked in with her, her jaw, her mouth was open, her eyelids were heavy, her head was down, uh, no muscle control. And so I can't talk to her because she's not going to talk back to me. So I put the mom in a folding chair in my living room and I said, just hold her. And she was kind of, she cries a lot. So she kind of was snuggled under her mother's hair. I knelt down on the floor and I just caressed her from head to tailbone. I just found myself doing this and in my thoughts, just asking for the healing that she needed to go wherever it had to go. Usually I direct more, but there was no way to direct this. So I'm doing this 10 minutes that little girl was jumping up and down on her mother's lap, throwing her head back and laughing. She was laughing. Now I've got two parents in tears, okay? So, and I don't fully understand. And they said to me, she can't support her weight for more than 10 seconds. So that first day that I saw her, her, oh, and, and again, she also uh, had no bowel control um, and she had therapy you know, it was, she was born this way. So she had multiple therapists during the week. Uh, she also had trouble swallowing. So uh, the bowel control corrected itself, the legs, the arms, the swallowing, all those things corrected themselves the first day, not everything, 
those things. So now they didn't tell me that. They left. I didn't hear from them for two months. Then I get a phone call because I used to tell people, you don't have to call me back. You don't need a second appointment. We didn't have emails or anything like that. I said, this is God's work. I'm doing whatever I have. You know, you don't have to come back. And I always told people that. Now I tell them only if you feel something. If you have change in your blood work, if you have a change in your body, if you can walk and you couldn't walk, a lot of them walk out of my house when they had a hard time getting in and they turn around and they look at me and, you know, I said, pay attention because you're not using your cane and you're not. So um, anyway, she, um, she called me two months later, they were going to the hospital. She was going to get pre-surgical testing to get her ureter reattached to her bladder. So um, they asked if they could come and they were, they lived a good hour away from me. So they were closer. So I said, sure. And this time she was sleeping when she came in. So she, I said, just leave her on the couch. I knelt on the floor and I did my job. And then I got up and I sat in my chair and I was directing my conversation to the parents. And when she woke up, the mom asked if she could change her. And I said, of course you can. So I talking to dad over here and she's changing her. And uh, when she was done, my peripheral vision, I saw her about to pick her up. I said, don't pick her up, put your thumbs out. Let her grab your thumb, see if she can pull herself up because the spine still had not corrected, not properly. If you sat her in, in the corner of my couch, she would fall over. So um, she took her, put her thumbs there and she pulled herself up. And then I took her because normally she wouldn't go to anybody else. And they said that, you know, she said, I don't know. And I said, well, just trust me. I picked her up. And I had a bunch of pictures of my children. My, father, my husband had built a, uh, a unit and they were way up high of their high school or college graduations by that point. And uh, so I held her and she, I brought her over to look at the pictures and she, I could see she was lifting her neck on her own and holding her own spine. So I let go and I showed them that I was not holding her. So second time around, all that corrected itself. Now, I didn't hear from her again. Two months went by. It was like this two month thing. And she called me up. And this time she wanted me to work on her son who had night terrors. But she said, I can't come to you because he's in kindergarten. It's a half day. And I had to go there. I said, oh, that's okay. I'll come. So I went and he wasn't off the bus yet. So here she was sitting in the living room on the floor, playing with toys, happy as a little lark. And, and so she gets up and she cruises the entertainment unit, comes all the way around to my, in between my legs. And I said, she's here. I'm here. I'm going to do some more. So I did, again, a bus comes, take care of the other situation, go home. Two months later, I get called to come to do the father-in-law and the mother-in-law. <laughs> okay, I'll be there. So I came. But when she called me that day, she said, when you left that day, and I put her to bed that night, I changed it, went to change her into her pajamas. And she said all her circulation had cleared. So I never saw her skin because I didn't look when the mother was changing her that day, but it was all purple and blue and pink and mottled. And, uh, and then I didn't hear anymore because they moved away. <laughs> so, you know, I just have always thought about that. And I mean, this is 25 years ago, easy, whatever happened. Uh, but it was just such an amazing thing to be a part of and to experience. And the, the parents didn't care because they loved her. Every little bit that happened and changed that made her a happy little girl was all that they cared about. Yeah. So, what a beautiful story. Oh, there's so many. Can you share what your classes are like? I know you teach now on spiritual sensitivity or spirituality. Can you talk a little about that? I know that you don't personally on the regular talk to spirit, although you do channel information clearly every day. Yeah, every day. I channel a lot of medical information. And that's what happens. And that's when I said earlier that I was a guinea pig. I believe today that part of my journey here was to experience all that physical illness. And since then, I've had heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. All well, I'm still working on the diabetes, actually. Uh, but the cancer, I, I say I have I had cancer for 15 minutes. <laughs> I didn't even think about it. I don't have fear. And that's one of the biggest things that I try to explain to people. Don't fear things. Don't fear. You just bring it to you faster or worse. Just keep out of the fear 
zone. And same with the heart disease. Everything was fine. I have my heart, according to my cardiologist, my heart is better than his. And, you know, I could do just about anything. But the teaching, now I have been teaching for the better part of 25 years. I was up to four, when my husband passed in 2012, I was teaching four classes a week at that point. And about 125 people would come through my doors every day. And I, I let it go for a while. Uh, I had to, I, I've sold my house and I didn't realize that I kind of cut my nose off to spite my face because I didn't have anywhere to teach people, you know? So I ended up, I ended up uh, starting to go into a hotel and, and renting space there, but I, I wasn't going to teach four classes a week anymore. I just, I put it out on Facebook and I said, anybody interested? And next thing I thinking it was just going to be a handful. It ended up to be 90 people. So, okay, I guess I'm going to rent more than one space. The word so gets out about you. Yes. The word gets <laughs> out. They actually, some of my students said, said they were going to pitch a tent on my front lawn if I didn't start teaching again. So I said, all right, all right, all right, all right. So um, I taught four times a month, I think. Uh, in the hotel. And some very interesting things happened there, but I'm going to hold that for a minute. I did, when, when the COVID came, I started teaching online. Now I wasn't going to, because I am not a technology person. And, and then I started, you know, I said, all right, every people are bugging me. They want me to teach and I can't go out anywhere. So I better learn how to do this. So I went to YouTube and I looked up, how do I do zoom? And then I went to YouTube because I had to now learn breakout rooms so that I could teach all these people and put them in different rooms so they could practice. I actually, I actually hold a practice venue. That's what I do for them. I see them first. I teach them what I need to teach them. They come to the class if I invite them because this is not advertised. No one sees it. I mean, look, I talk about it. People talk about it online, but no one can come to my class until they meet me first. I have to feel their energy. Okay. Whether it's in Hong Kong, it doesn't matter. I have them all over the world. I have an international class that I teach on Sundays. Uh, and that's for the people that are sleeping when I'm teaching from eight to 10 at night. And then let's see the Asians and Australians and, and they can come to my nighttime class. So when I feel the energy and I know they're compatible with the rest of the class, that's when they get invited because I, I've been in a class that was not compatible, that people, any, anybody that wanted to come came. And then you really, it, energies just don't gel that way. I need it to feel right to me. And it always, I, and I always put it together right. But new people come constantly. There's no beginning. There's no end. I don't have a class that says, okay, you start here and you end here. That's not how it works. It is people from 20, 25 years ago can pop in if they want to. That It's always like that. And they do. So if maybe they just want to hang out with some spiritual people or talk to me or something for a while. And next thing you know, they're in the class. So it's a little different. It is a practice venue. I'm not giving them the first half an hour, I give instruction or people talk about spiritual stories. Maybe it's a reading, maybe it's a healing, maybe it's a, a sign, maybe it was a dream. It doesn't matter as long as it stays in that spiritual box. And then we do a meditation. One of my ones that I have on YouTube, Universal White Light and Meditation, yeah. the most popular of all. And we do that. And then I send them into breakout rooms and they get several turns back and forth. I pull, put them in, I pull them out, I put them in, I pull them out. And then we will meet back on the screen. And if they still have somebody that they have a message for, it'll come out there. But it's not just mediums, it's healers. So people are doing healing. I feel people are limitless. I really do. So I encourage all of them to do both. You know, the, the mediums are doing healing, the healers are doing giving messages and I'm just kind of, and then when they, I just feel like they're my chiclets and then I push them out of the box and make room for others. When someone is ready to do something professionally, whether it's reading or healing, I do a courtesy meeting with them and, uh, and I listen and I break it down and I see where they're at, if they need more practice, if they're ready to open a practice of their own. And, uh, and then I direct them that way, but everybody stays attached to me. 
everybody comes back. It's like a, it's just amazing to me. Just to, it, it, again, if there was anybody more humbled in this world, it's me by the loyalty these people show to me and the love that they have. I just had a bunch over for lunch one day because they, and they're, and they're still, they're working on the next time, but it's very hard to get a lot of schedules together. And they, we just want to be in each other's energy. So, and I know that personally, because I know people who have been your students, they love you. Oh, <laughs> they just love you. I and love I, them right back. And, and it shows, you know, one of the things that I think is so perfect about the work you do, Pat, is, you know, clear up my belief system, and maybe yours is too, that we decide prior to incarnation, what we're going to be doing here. So there was a decision made that you were going to be working with energy. Yeah. You are the most kind, easy, comfortable. I mean, you look like someone, I want you for my neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that makes it so easy for people to come into your space and get something that maybe is not as mainstream in our society as it might need to be. Well, thank you. I do feel that way when people come in and they come into my home and they love the energy here. That's one thing everybody says. It's just and they don't want to leave. You know, I've had a lot of autistic children come in and, uh, you know, they want to sit on my lap. Now, I'm, I told you how little I am. So when a 13 year old sits on my lap, you know, it, it's they're very large and sometimes they, they can't be touched. So they'll lay on the floor and, and I just lay, let my hands drop over the chair and do it. Or I'll have one with really severe OCD and they're standing, putting in my VCR over and over again and at which I don't have anymore, but, uh, and then I'm following them around. I do whatever I have to do. I move wherever I have to move and it just works. And I'm again, so grateful and so humble that I received this gift and that I get to do it every day and I get to share it and people heal. Not everybody. Let me just be clear on that because part of my journey, which I didn't realize, uh, but right in the very beginning, I learned that I have to help people transition. And it's not my favorite part of the journey, but I do know that I can bring people peace. I can take them out of pain when they are suffering. And I've seen it over and over and over again, even little children. And I'm, I'm going to knock on wood because I'm blessed to only have had a very, very few that, that did not get healed. The others are ringing the bells and all done with chemo. And I just work on them before MRIs and CAT scans just to, just because uh, it puts the mother's mind at ease. Usually um, the children are great. I mean, they're the best. They, they trust me in every way, shape or form. And they just listen. They don't have that fear base that we as adults grow with. Yeah. Um, you know, so I am, I'm in a, I'm in a great position, I guess, or profession. And I don't. I expect to be here for a very long time. I'm. I'm. I'm looking at least till ninety five. I've already <laughs> projected that out. But we did choose all of this. Yes, we, chose we did it all. We chose it all, and now we're here. And um, you know, here we go again. I know we don't have a lot of time, but I feel like I just thought of an automatic writing that literally it's called the reasons why. And it was written, oh my goodness, I lost a grandchild uh, 23 years ago. And um, this was channeled, uh, not by me. Um, it's called The Reasons Why. The reasons are so few and wide. We often wonder who's on our side. We look to see who's keeping track. We need the faith without looking back. You see, you chose who, when, and where. You chose your life, and now you're here. To make a difference, you had to come and leave you won't until you're done. You will be placed in many roles to help achieve the many goals. As teacher or student, it matters not. To make a difference, this is your spot. So do it wisely and led you'll be. He helps us all, we're family. The bigger picture will soon unfold. Be brave and wise and especially bold. We all have help from up above. We're never alone. There's plenty of love. So keep the faith and wonder no more. He has given us strength so we can soar. To understand the reasons why and when and where, don't even try. 
Just believe and trust in the Almighty One. He'll help us all until we're done. With love and mercy, he forgives us all. He's always there in case we fall. So onward, men, to do and try, but please don't ask the reasons why. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. This conversation has been so lovely, and getting to know you has just been such a treat. Thank you so much. How do we find out more about you if people want to get more, which I'm sure they will at this point? Well, uh, email um, patlongo1111 at gmail.com. Uh, that is my work email and uh, my assistant takes care of everything. Uh, she, she emails me my schedules at about midnight at night. I never know what <laughs> I'm doing until I don't go to bed till one thirty. So I'm up, I'm up late and I'm up early. Uh, I also, whatever they do to me, I don't need as much sleep as I used to. And uh, uh, I'm all ready to jump out of bed and, and keep on moving. Um, patlongo.net is my website. And my, the number that I can be reached is uh, 516-433-5279. Uh, and that's a landline. And uh, I actually do the opposite with my cell phone. My cell phone is my personal. Because when I started this business, there were no there, cell phones. There were no cell phones. <laughs> my home line became <laughs> my business line. And I've kept it that way. So, yeah. And, uh, and, I guess and you're on YouTube fun. as well. Yeah, I'm on YouTube. I, I'm on YouTube. Uh, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm all over the place. Um, I remember before I said there was a sneaky little, not a sneaky little thing, but I put my hand up and said, I'll tell you about that later. Have you looked at my Instagram? I have not. Okay. Well, this has come out a lot. So um, it's not a secret, but it's not known to a lot of people. But I discovered, well, for 30 years of doing this, every time I meditate, my head would go back. I remember it going back in the class that I was in and I wanted to put it up and it just wouldn't go. It would say all the way back. But as time went by, my arms started to extend and I would be like this. It's very uncomfortable. I mean, it feels like my arms are being pulled out of my socket and whatever. But during the time in that hotel uh, that I was teaching, um, I would meditate my students always before we, we would go into practice. And one night, we were doing an exercise and I had my, they had their eyes open and this is what they saw on the wall behind me. Wow. And I have hundreds of them. I didn't know anything about it because I couldn't see it. But what happens is these shadows come out of my body and they come out of the floor and they, oh. they, go, they reach to me. If you could see, you'll see this extra arms. I started to grow like six or seven more pair of arms, but they, my, my sister is, would be in the class and like they have points down in the baseboard and they go up and they attach like gigantic archangel wings. Mm -hmm. And then I'm, the last one I'm going to show you. And again, I have hundreds, I have animals. There's all kinds of things that stand behind me. Jesus, Mary, I don't, they see them. My students see them. Children, this is a 19 second video. Wow. And I want you to just watch the shadows move up and watch what happens when the shadow touches my hand. Oh, wow. Yeah. And if you look at it again, it's like Jesus is standing behind me in a robe. And that's what I see. And that's what my students saw. So the hand is now, I didn't know it was a hand. Now it touches. Mm -hmm. Hand comes out of the robe sleeve. Oh, the my gosh. Whole thing. So I know I have a lot of help. That's just you have. Help. You I have the A-team. I have the A team and the people that have seen the big archangels, they go right through the ceiling. So they're very big and they stand around me and I'm very grateful to have them. I don't see them and I don't talk to them, but they're there. <laughs> so, okay. Wonderful. Pat, this has just been so spectacular. I appreciate your time. We can and chat again another time because I would love to have you come back if, if you can fit it 100%. in your very busy schedule. 100%. 100%. Okay. All right. Thank you Thank so you much. All right. All right. Thank you everyone for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Coming up next, this is a good one. Or you might really like this one too. Either one of them could be perfect for you. Before you leave, don't forget to subscribe.